It was Bethlehem, the end of a long night. The star had just disappeared. The last pilgrim had left the stable. The virgin arranged the straw, and at last the child could sleep. Gently, the door opens so gently that it seems more like the wind was pushing it than a hand. A woman appears on the threshold, covered with rags. She was so old and wrinkled that you could have thought her mouth was one more deep wrinkle in a face the color of dirt. A fearful chill came over Mary when she saw her, as if a malicious one had come into the room. Fortunately, Jesus was asleep. The ass and the ox placidly continued munching their hay as if there was nothing unusual, as if they had known her forever. The virgin didn't take her eyes off her. The woman walked slowly, each step seeming to take centuries. She continued, the old woman, and approached the manger. Thank God Jesus was still sleeping. Suddenly, he opened his eyelids. His mother was completely astonished to see that the eyes of the old woman and his eyes were exactly the same. They both shone with the same hope. The old woman sank down on the straw. One hand disappeared into her rags, looking for something, taking ages to find it. Mary watched her closely, still concerned. The animals watched her too, but always without surprise, as if they knew beforehand what was going to happen. Finally, after a long time, slowly, tiredly, the old woman pulls out of her clothes a little object hidden in her hand, and she gives it to the child. All the treasures of the wise men and the offerings of the shepherds, what could this present be? From where she was, Mary could not tell. She saw only the shoulders bowed down, the woman's back bent over from age, now bent over even more before the crib, and the child within. The ox and the ass watched and were not amazed. The woman stayed bowed before the child a long time. And finally, she arose as if relieved from a great weight which had dragged her to the ground. Her shoulders were no longer bowed down. Her head almost touched the low roof. Her face seemed miraculously renewed, as if she was finding once more the vigor of her youth. She turned from the crib, smiled at Mary, and went out through the door into the dawning day. Finally, Mary could see the mysterious present. An apple, a little apple, having within it all the sin of the world, given to the baby Jesus by Eve, for it was her, the old woman who had come to worship the child born of her blood, who would save her from her sins, the apple of the original sin, the sin of so many who would follow. And the little red apple shone in the hands of the child as if it were the globe of the kingdom and of the new world which had just been born with the king. This parable by the Thoreau brothers makes a very moving point. Jesus is the son of Adam and Eve. You know that scientists not long ago have, through their research in genetics, come up with the mitochondrial gene proving that all genetics go back to one woman. Science has proven what we've believed for thousands of years. We call her Eve. And that same woman from whom we all descend, and Adam, whose name means man, Jesus, one of the prophecies, son of man, Ben Adam, is truly man. And he received his humanity to the Virgin Mary. But at the same time, he is truly God, because he was conceived miraculously by the power of the Holy Spirit. And Mary contemplates, as the scripture tells us today in the gospel, she contemplates all these things in her heart. She didn't have 
infused knowledge such that she got it all instantly. No, she had to reflect on these things. She was puzzled. She was confused at the beginning at the Annunciation. And surely now on the eighth day when Jesus was circumcised, he bled like a human being. He cried like a human being. He opened his eyes like a human being because he is human. And yet at the same time, she knows he was conceived miraculously by the Holy Spirit and is somehow, some way, also a divine one, the eternal Son of God. This great mystery is why we call Mary Mother of God. Not that Mary is a goddess. Indeed, she would laugh at that. She would deny it. She would be insulted by it. There is but one God, the Lord God, the Almighty God. But she was given the privilege to be his mother. The God who had no mother in heaven had no father of the earth, but had a mother. And so this God-man has his mother Mary, who is indeed the mother of God and the mother of the new Adam. Mary is the new Eve, you see, who gives her whole yes to God. And in so doing, gives us the new Adam who gives his life as the God-man to save the world. He gave his life for us. He was born for that purpose. Yes, today was the first day he shed his blood, the eighth day of Christmas, the day of his circumcision, and the day on which Joseph gave him his name. Not Bar-Joseph or Ben-Joseph. They named him Yeshua, Yeshua. God saves, in Greek, Jesus, the term we use, the Savior. Now I know as we begin this new year, many of you will begin a physical fitness program starting tomorrow. <laughs> what I suggest to you as we begin the new year is that we all need a spiritual fitness program if we wish to see this year 2017 to be any better than last year. It has to begin in us. Yes, this is the world day of prayer for peace through the intercession of the Queen of Peace and the Prince of Peace, the Savior of the world. But if we do not work at peace, interior peace, spiritual peace, it will not happen. It must begin within. And so I give you this seven-point plan for your spiritual fitness program. Number one, give glory to God. What did Mary do when she approached her cousin Elizabeth and Elizabeth immediately, by, inspired by the Holy Spirit, says, Blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Does she say, Oh yes, you're quite right. <laughs> Hardly. Mary immediately gives the glory to God. What does she say? My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior who has looked with favor on his lowly servant. Mary gives all the glory to God. You and I need to start giving glory to God, making a public witness to it. No longer hiding our Christianity, but giving glory to God. You remember Usain Bolt? How could we forget? The fastest runner in the world. The fastest man on earth. Do you know he wears a miraculous medal and gives glory to God? And thanks to the Virgin Mary for her protection. He's not ashamed. Neither should we be ashamed to give glory to to God, when you say things like, thanks be to God, somebody thanks you. Somebody said you did a good job. Thanks be to God. Give the glory to God. That's the first step in a good spiritual fitness program. Number two, prepare the best version of yourself. You see, God wants the best for you. That's what God wants. Mary wants the best for you as any good mother would. The question is, are you willing to offer that version of yourself back to God? You know, your life is God's gift to you. What you do with it is your gift to God. Will you give God the best version of yourself? Or will you settle for mediocrity or worse? A spiritual fitness demands the best. Doesn't any athlete aim for the best? Of course that you do. Number three. As you run your race to heaven, fix your eyes on Jesus. The letter of the Hebrews reminds us of that. We are to fix our eyes on Jesus. He knows the way. He's led the way. 
He's opened the gates for you. And so if you're going to be spiritually fit, keep your eyes on Jesus. What would Jesus do? How did he live his life? That's the example. Fix your eyes on Jesus is the third step in a spiritual fitness program. Number four, you must make sacrifices like any athlete makes sacrifices for the training. And the sacrifice we must make is turning away from sin and exercising the virtues. For example, on New Year's Day, to turn down the fourth slice of pie, <laughs> that's called temperance, right? Self-control in food and drink, that's one of the virtues, one of the many virtues. We have to start exercising the virtues, our spiritual muscles, in order to be spiritually fit. That's the fourth. Exercise the virtues and sacrifice for your training. Number five, take spiritual reading, whether it's the Gospels, the Psalms, anything in the Scriptures, spiritual prayer books, little daily devotionals. Take something, spiritual food, nourishment, every day, right? Just as you're, if you're going to have a physical fitness program, you've got to do a little something every day or you get away from it. So it is with spiritual truth. The Word of God and writings of the saints like St. Francis de Sales' Introduction to the Devout Life. There are many, many works that will help you exercise the life of grace. And so that is your fifth step in devotional reading. Number six, offer a morning offering. That's probably the best prayer of the day is to begin the day as you offer the whole day to God. I offer you all my prayers, works, joys, and sufferings of this day for all the intentions of your sacred heart. Salvation of souls, reparation for sin, the reunion of all Christians, in union with the holy sacrifice of the Mass offered throughout the world. And there are many different versions of that morning offering. But that way you give the day to God. When First thing when you get up, Lord, I thank you for this new day, and now I offer it to you. Use a morning offering if you want to see a different 2017 and begin right away. And the final in the seven steps of the spiritual fitness program I suggest to you is make a retreat. Perhaps you could, if you had an extended amount of time, a few days or a week, go up to the Pecos Monastery, for example, and make a retreat there at Our Lady of Guadalupe Abbey to get away from all the distractions of the world. If you can't get away for that long, what about taking a day, even a hike up in the mountains, to be still with God? Maybe it's even just in your backyard or in the Adoration Chapel somewhere that you make a spiritual retreat to examine the direction of your life and take a new direction fixed with your eyes on Jesus as you run the race to heaven. So the first step again, give glory to God. The second, prepare the best version of yourself. The third, fix your eyes on Jesus as you run to heaven. The fourth, make sacrifices, turning away from sin and exercising the virtues. The fifth, spiritual reading. The sixth, a morning offering each day. And finally, some kind of spiritual retreat. And if you do this, even some of it, preferably all of it, I suggest your 2017 will certainly be a step forward in the right direction towards inner peace of soul and thereby bringing peace into our world. Pope Benedict XV, not the 16th, the living Pope who is retired, the Emeritus Pope, but this was Benedict XV who was reigning during World War I. It was 1917, the World War had been three years in the making, and there was more to come, even with Russia turning into a communist nation at the end of that very year. But Pope Benedict XV made a plea in May of that year, and this is what he said. To Mary, who is the mother of mercy, let loving and devout appeal go up from every corner of the earth, from noble temples and tiniest chapels, from royal palaces and from the poorest hut, from every place where a faithful soul finds shelter, from the blood-drenched plains 
and the seas. Let it bear to her the anguished cry of mothers and wives, the wailing of innocent little ones, the sighs of every generous heart, that her most tender and benign solicitude may be moved, and that the peace we ask for be obtained for our agitated world. Do you know, eight days after the Pope made that appeal, the Blessed Virgin Mary appeared to three little children in a place called Fatima, Portugal, on May the 13th, 1917, 100 years ago. My prayer to Almighty God and to our Blessed Lady is that on the 100th anniversary of the apparition of Our Lady of Fatima as the Queen of Peace and the Mother of the World and the Queen of the Holy Rosary who asked us to pray the Rosary each day for peace, that it will be this year that there will be a divine illumination of souls so that we can really turn things around. And I conclude with a prayer that Pope John Paul, St. John Paul wrote for that very purpose as we entrust ourselves to Our Lady on this, the eighth day of Christmas, the first day of the new year. O Mother of all peoples, you know our sufferings and our hopes. You maternally feel all the struggles between good and evil, between the light and darkness which shake this world. Receive our cry, directed in the Holy Spirit straight to your heart, and with the love of the mother and handmaid of the Lord, embrace the individuals and peoples who most look for this embrace and who trust you to attend to them in a particular way. Take the entire human family under your maternal protection Without flows of affection, O oh Mother, we entrust it to you. May the time of truth, justice, and hope approach for all. A time of liberty and a time of peace, both now and forever. Amen.